involved as liaisons to Bay Bridge. Um, so that was a really great event to hear about their experiences, not only at school, um, but in our community. And uh, next month, we will be doing a lot of work around um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day. We have formed a coalition with other organizations on the North Shore uh, for not only a day of service, but of recognition, education, and advocacy. So I invite you to check out our website, which is baybridgewisconsin.org. We had to add the Wisconsin because uh, Bay Bridge is a popular name. So we um, had to differentiate by adding Wisconsin. And additionally, if you want to get in touch with us at any point, our email is baybridgewisconsin at gmail.com. So we, as I mentioned with um, January, we'll have a series of opportunities to volunteer and connect. There will be an online uh, faith-based service. We're going to do a sandwich making blitz for a food bank, just one more ministry that we work with on a regular basis, but we will be um, kind of amping up that service activity. So there will be a lot of ways um, to get involved. So um, without much further ado, I do want to start to introduce our panelists. Um, we have about eight panelists with us tonight who will each get five minutes to tell us about their organization. And um, we're really excited to have them here with us. This is a way to connect with some groups with which you may be familiar or maybe ones that are new to you. But these are all people that we found to be really inspiring to us, people that are making a huge amount of difference in our community. And there will be opportunities afterwards to ask questions. And if you want, um, to get involved or possibly even consider making a holiday donation to one of their very worthy causes. So um, it was hard, hard to keep this group um, to a small level. There are so many great organizations, but these were ones where we had personal connections and we welcome our panelists here tonight. Um, so we will, actually be having uh, Kathy Werzer has our clock and has chimes to keep us on task. So after five minutes for each panelist, you'll hear a pleasing chime sound. That means that we will move on to the next. And uh, Jean Plum has prepared along with the panelists a very nice slide presentation to support each of their um, segments. So Tonight, we will be starting with Kai gardner Mishlov of Aurora Walkers Point Community Clinic. Um, Kai works with the refugee population and she has also started um, something called Tables Across Borders, but I will let you tell, tell her more about it. Tell that to you. Thank you so much, Kai, for being here tonight. So Kai, if you want to unmute and Jean, if you want to pull up the slides, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much for having me. Um, thank you for all the work that you're doing at Bay Bridge to address, you know, all of the inequities that we're dealing with in our society. Um, I'm a firm believer in building bridges as a way to, um, you know, to alleviate some of the disparities that we're dealing with in our community. So my name is Kai and I'm the program coordinator for refugee health services at the Aurora Walkers Point Community Clinic. A lot of folks do not realize that this clinic is the largest free clinic in the state. And we provide services to um, not only refugees, but 75% of our patient population is from the Latinx community and 75% of our population makes less than $10,000 a year. So we're, try we're dealing with very, very vulnerable communities. I specifically work with the refugee community. They're coming from Syria, from Somalia, from Ethiopia, from Burma, from you know all over the world. And the purpose is to provide inclusive programming that's innovative because I feel that you cannot address some of the stigmas and some of the underlying health issues and disparities 
in a community, in a society, if you don't address some of the underlying social issues that contribute to it. So I've developed all sorts of innovative programming to address social isolation and some of the other things, I mean, social isolation and some of the other things that you can imagine that new refugees are dealing with, especially given the last uh, couple of years, there's been a lot of negative rhetoric about who refugees are in our society. So we've done things like put together um, a welcome neighbor program of which everyone is invited to participate in where we're setting up uh, uh, people from the community to be not only mentors, because I feel like that's a two way street, but buddies to new families coming in to help them acclimate. I set up a global cuisine project, such as the Tables Across Borders project, connecting refugee chefs to local restaurants and to the community. And the whole purpose is to, to um, broaden the horizons of our Milwaukee community and also connect people to each other. So we do various health and wellness workshops, exercise and nutrition. We have a Salam Shalom, Salam baby shower that we've done for refugee patients that many of you have participated in from the Whitefish Bay area and the North Shore. And during COVID, we had to pivot. All of our in-person programming such as Zumba, all of the stuff that's not paid by anything except out of our own pockets, the pockets of staff, we had to pivot to remote work. So I'm working mostly remote now. So that means I'm doing a lot of porch drops and a lot of Zoom programming. So we're doing Zoom on, you know, online now and addressing some of the mental health um, uh, disparities that people are dealing with, the social isolation. So we're doing all sorts of things, dropping off lavender oil on doorstops to say, hey, you know, apply this and it'll, you know, and, and do some deep breathing and, you know, let's drop off some flowers on your, on your doorstop. And also an arts and crafts cooperative. I'm trying to assist some of the women who are working with us on um, developing skills that they can market. And what you didn't see is I'm wearing a scarf that one of the women made. So these are some of the innovative programming that people don't think of as health, but it is health. So I appreciate any kind of consideration you can give towards giving towards our um, program. And here on the slide, it shows all of the different things that we're doing. Thank you so much for everything that you're doing. And I look forward to answering any questions that people may have you know, at any time. Hi, could I ask you to turn your video on and show us your oh, scarf? Yes, okay. Let's see, can you see it? You see it now? So, you know, we partner with a lot of different community groups. This was something we went to, we took a bunch of women from our refugee program to the Linden Sculpture Garden, where they learned from one of the artists and residents of how to, um, how to dye silk. So these are some of the, the projects that we do at the clinic. And I'm trying to set up this cooperative so that not only are people able to cook and sell their food, but also sell their crafts. Kai, that's amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you for showing us that pretty scarf. And for people on the call, um, if you want to see the speakers, um, this is just a technical detail. If you can go to um, the top of, if you see a column of people right now, Hopefully you have a middle box that says show active speaker video, and then you should be able to see the person speaking as well as the slide presentation. And then I also encourage you to use the chat to drop your questions in and we will try to address those towards the end. So thank you again, Kai, for your amazing work and for being here tonight, appreciate it. Thank you. Um, next on the list, we have our friends at Five Points Oh, we're gonna do Jakari. Hold that thought, people. Um, Jakari's Kicks for Kids. Jakari, I saw you jump in. So um, welcome, Jakari. And we look forward to hearing a little bit about your organization. And Jakari, you can unmute and start sharing your video as well, if you'd like. Yes, can you guys hear me? Yes. <laughs> perfect, perfect, so I'm Jakari Carr the CEO of Jakari Kicks for Kids. Um, our mission at Jakari Kicks for Kids is to develop students spiritually, academically, socially, physically, and emotionally from adolescence through adulthood. We provide a comprehensive program that prepares our students for advancement in the educational system and instills the values necessary to live well in this world. Can you go to the next slide, please? The next one also, I'm sorry.
Eight years. <clears throat> Next slide. Yes. Perfect. So our core values are leadership, excellence, and community. And these core values drive everything we do. They serve as our guiding principles for Jakari Kids for Kids staff, volunteers, and families. And these values underlie our work and determine how we interact with each other and which strategies we employ to fulfill our mission. So at Jakari Kicks for Kids, I started this eight years ago, so around 2012. And we're mostly known for our shoe customization program and our shoe drive giveaway. So what that is, is when our youth collect shoes, we customize those shoes, and then we give those shoes to youth in need before school starts, along with haircuts and hairdos and book bags with supplies so they can go on to school and focus on their education and not be bullied or teased for their appearance. I've been a community activist for the last five years. So a lot of that work pours into my, uh, into my nonprofit also because the work I see out in the streets and a lot of the kids I see in the streets, they're looking for help and they don't have anyone that quite understands them. And I'm one of those people that just really gets to understand them. The programs we currently offer, if you could turn to the next slide. The programs we currently offer is our connection program, our community events program, our life skill training and our tutoring program. So our connection program is our donate and restore program. That's when we receive donations, our kids restore them and then we give those to kids in need. Our community events programming is from toy drives, coat drives and fashion shows. But due to COVID this year, we did three food giveaways to families in need because we know a lot of families were in need. Our third programming is life skill training. And that's when we offer young people between the ages of 10 to 18, life skill training for job interviews, computer literacy, resume building, college application, email etiquette, and more. And then finally is our tutoring program. And that's when we offer tutoring and mentoring to high school, I mean, ages 10 to 18, but mostly focused on high school students. If you turn to the next slide, I posted some pictures of the work we do so you guys can see. So in the community, a lot of kids are big on sneakers and their fashion. And a lot of families just don't have the funding to pay for that. So what I started Jakari Kicks for Kids based on is giving away sneakers. I knew that was a way I could reach kids, kids that you usually can't reach, the kids that have bad GPAs. I wanted to figure a way to get in tune with them. So I would offer sneakers if they would get a 3.0 GPA. What you guys can see on the picture is the pictures ahead is these students are restoring sneakers. So they're restoring sneakers for the other community kids who are in need. But if they have a 3.0 or on A's, they'll get a pair of sneakers for their grades. By doing that, I got the kids to be more in tune with school. And a lot of my kids are now succeeding with a 3.0 GPA or higher. Can you go to the next slide, please? So this was our year's, this was this year's book bag giveaway. Due to COVID, we did a book bag giveaway uh, through drive through And that's when we have all of our youth who we help throughout the year come back and then pass book bags to the families that's in need so they can go to school uh, together and fresh and don't have to worry about being bullied or teased for not having supplies or material. Can you go to the next slide, please? So the guy on the left, that's Jamal Williams, the Packer running back the Packers backup running back and those shoes he have in his hands is some shoes that we created along with our students. So we created those shoes for Jamal Williams so he can wear them in practice or in games, but also so he can engage back in our organization and talk with the kids. We noticed by having different uh, NFL and NBA players, we were able to get the kids to be more engaged on their, on their education also. The picture on the right is me doing a shoe drive with my team in Chicago, Illinois. And this was huge for us because we met a lot of connections and that's how we got connected to Jamal Williams. Can you go to the next slide, please? This picture means a lot to me because I was the first African-American male that these kids met mm -hmm. and they're sixth graders. And I met them through my connection program of doing shoes and they just thought I was so amazing that they wanted to meet me. And through that, they became a part of my programming and we have done uh, tons of events together that's just been amazing. Last slide, please, because I know my time is running up. Perfect. What I have going on this summer, Jakari Summer Scholars, which is a four week all day summer day camp that will be at St. Marcus North Campus, is for all of the inner city kids that attend St. Marcus or live around the St. Marcus area. Our expected outcomes is that youth will perform at a grade level 
or above in reading mathematics, that youth are accepted at one or more post-secondary <laughs> educational institutions, that are you graduate high school at a goal of 90%, and that youth graduate from either a two-year or four-year post-secondary educational program or complete military service in a branch of the armed forces, and our goal for that is 75%. If you guys uh, would like to support Jakari Kicks for Kids in any way, this summer camp will be huge because we'll be hosting 75 students. We usually would do 125, but due to COVID, we were trying to host 75 students. This program will help students with so many things that can help them in life. And um, I'm just so grateful to have this opportunity to show you guys what I'm working on. And uh, I look forward to hearing from you guys. Also, a huge shout out to my mentor, Al Rupel, for just everything he helped me with. Um, and thank you guys for this opportunity. It's so amazing to be here with you guys. Thank you, Jakari. So glad to have you here. And I've seen the kids painting the shoes and the creativity that comes out in that refurbishment process too. It's pretty exciting. So hopefully everybody's really feeling all the great energy here tonight and um, the wonderful things people are doing. So thank you, Jakari, for what you do and for being here tonight. Appreciate thank you. you as well. I appreciate you. Thanks. All right. Um, it looks like now we do have the Five Points Neighborhood Association slides ready to go. And if I could just ask everyone who is not presenting to please re-mute yourselves. Um, and hiding the video will also help with our connectivity. Um, but um, Mr. Churchill, if you would like to please unmute yourself and you may show your video as well. And then you'll show up in the speaker view. Um, Five Points Neighborhood Association has been a really great partner to Bay Bridge. Um, they are a community that is just to the south of us. And um, they are near Port Washington Road. Um, I have all the five points written down, but I always have to remind myself. But maybe, um, Mr. Churchill, you want to tell us a little bit about where you are geographically. Um, but thank you for being here tonight. And um, we'd like thank to you. learn a little bit more about you. Thanks. Oh, sure. Thank you so much for having us. I really appreciate it. Uh, uh, I haven't done a whole lot of work with uh, Bay Bridge, but I, I certainly appreciate this opportunity to to be here on the call tonight and uh, tell you a little bit more about Five Points Neighborhood Association. Uh, Five Points Neighborhood Association uh, was not uh, that in the beginning. It, it was uh, really a bunch of uh, block clubs that we later decided that, that we could be more effective by, by becoming an association and that's what we did. And that's maybe about three or four years ago if my memory serves me. Uh, so we became an association as well as a, a nonprofit organization. And we are primarily uh, came together to effectively try to do some things for the people in our, our, our working area, which is maybe about uh, 15 square miles uh, east to west, uh, Holton to Green Bay, I think that's right. And as far south as uh, uh, Locust. So that's our working area. So uh, we have an older population and uh, primarily we wanted to uh, just be effective in helping the older population. Uh, that was our first charter just to uh, address the needs uh, of them. And that was our catalyst for becoming an association. But later we open ourselves up to more projects uh, concerning everybody in the, uh, uh, the working area, so as an association. And those five points that you see there are our are, are mantra for doing some things as far as our association. We like to address the blight. Uh, we, we work on the leadership. Uh, we have about uh, uh, effectively maybe a 15 member board and we're constantly trying to groom our leaders. Uh, we work to improve home ownership and financial literacy, that's our, 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 one of our big things. And uh, we do a lot of focus on mental health training and intervention and uh, uh, school everybody on the proper uh, climate for political decisions. And uh, uh, as I mentioned before, doing some work for our seniors. That's our website there, if you wanna make note of that. Okay, next sli slide, please. 
Uh, here you see some pictures of 5PNA has a formal process of working with partners. Uh, and to the top left there, you see a group of people uh, working with us. Those are actually uh, uh, UWM students uh, that we work with. We partnered with UWM uh, uh, Service Learner Program. And the way that program works, it, it allows uh, students that want to uh, uh, get credit for working in neighborhoods and our associations like ours. And they are, were helping us uh, do some work in one of our big projects. We have a vacant lot that we are trying to improve uh, and they were helping us out on that day. Uh, there were about uh, 15 or 20 uh, service learner students that we get each uh, spring or so. Uh, and the program has been going well for maybe a year two to three years now. And we have a different slate of students every time. And these students uh, have disciplines that cover all different kind of areas from engineers to uh, students that are in interested in nursing, horticulture. Uh, they all come together and, and uh, we are luck blessed to have enough students join us for our projects. And that's what you see to the left there. Uh, let's see. I blocked some of my screen. To, to the immediate right of that uh, is another picture of, we have what, what's called block pop-ups and uh, we allow vendors to uh, show their wares on these particular pop-up days. And that was one, one of the events that we had where vendors came and uh, just displayed some of the products that they have to offer and they uh, offered that to some of the people in the neighborhood. This it, to the bottom there on your bottom left, uh, that's uh, more pictures of service learner students helping us uh, on a woodworking project where we were trying to build some benches and uh, they were helping us stain, stain the wood for the benches there. Okay, and the immediate right of that is one of our group meetings. Okay, one more slide, please. And that's, uh, you see the bench there that, that we uh, finished working on. And to the left of that, at the top left, uh, that's a bigger picture of the, the, the project that we're working on as far as the vacant lot. And another picture to your uh, immediate right, uh, far right that is, uh, one of our meetings and more pictures of the lot and, uh, we have an annual, uh, the middle, middle bottom picture there. I think that's, boy, it's been so long since I've seen some of these pictures. But anyway, I think that's one of our uh, groups where we were, uh, occasions where we were, were preparing for our annual senior, senior dinner uh, uh, that we host every year. Uh, we put on a big dinner to honor the seniors, like I said in the beginning, uh, the big majority of our residents in our area are seniors and we want to honor them and we were preparing for the uh, dinner that day. And the last picture, bottom right, is just the hall that we meet in. We meet in a church uh, and that this shows you uh, us preparing for the meeting, the monthly meeting. I, I think that's it. Thank you, Mr. Crowthers. We appreciate you being here tonight. And I know um, you guys have been really responsive to the pandemic as well. Um, early on, I saw the, the drive that you did and Mr. Sims showed me, he was actually storing a lot of the stuff in his garage. I think the, um, the thermometers and the, the, um, the wipes and the hand sanitizer and things that you distributed to the community. So you guys have been really responsive to yes. your and, uh, community uh, members. And I did miss some pictures and, and you, uh, you're showing some pictures that I think where we address some of those things right there. At, okay. Okay. There. Well, it's so much. And then I know um, you do some advocacy work as well. I think there are some concerns about, um, I know gentrification is an ongoing concern. I actually did um, put a Facebook post on one of the articles um, that was from a while back about your neighborhood association and some of the advocacy work. So if people want to go back that. to the Bay Bridge Facebook page and um, a few days back, there's an art a very nice article about Five Points Neighborhood Association. Yes, thank you so much. Yours. I really appreciate what you did for us. Thank you.
No, thank you. Thank you so much for being here and thanks for everything you do. Um, again, just drop your questions in the chat. We will get to them towards the end. And one of our last slides is contact information for all these organizations as well. So it's a lot to take in. We're trying to accomplish a lot here in a short amount of time. So um, we appreciate your patience and we will have more contact information towards the end. And now I'd like to welcome um, McCannon Brown to our presentation tonight. Um, McCannon, if you would like to unmute yourself and show your video as well. Um, McCannon Brown is the founder of a homeless sanctuary. Um, I believe um, your new location is under construction and I'm guessing you will give us an update on that status as well. So thank you for being here tonight. Very honored, very happy to be here. And I appreciate that the people that are listening and viewing are in search of what can be done. I really appreciate your quest, your, your inquiry that unites you into bringing myself and these other very good presenters this evening, uh, people doing good work in the community. So I represent a vision that is very unique even to this country. Um, I do not have a video. I do recommend people going to our website. I won't have enough time uh, to give a lot of detail. Uh, I do appreciate the time that has been allotted to me. Um, if you go to our website, actually on our homepage, the feature, the spotlight is Whitefish Bay United Methodist Church this time uh, in a series. And that congregation has been incredibly involved since this organization, my new chapter uh, became a, a licensed nonprofit with nothing except the licensing, the vision, a small board of directors uh, five years ago. Previous to that, I was co-founder and executive director of Repairers of the Breach for 22 years and with other people grew it into a premier nonprofit in Milwaukee, um, very uh, impactful. Uh, and then as that, uh, I, went, I moved on from that organization and have this new chapter as the PowerPoint will explain if you go to the website. Um, my name is on this, not by my choice, but by the founders resolve to uh, respect my legacy as the new organization was found. So it's not a me, myself, and I. It's actually a we thing. And it's part of the incredible uh, message from young people now, millennials and so forth, this message that the world needs a we awakening. The vision that I represent and am honored to lead in this new chapter is about a solidarity model that is very unusual for Milwaukee and it is very unusual even in this country. We are located and established in the 53206 zip code, which many of you know is the most impoverished uh, zip code and resource scarce zip code in Wisconsin. Actually, where we are located is one of eight communities nationwide that has the worst living conditions. And we're doing something there, even while our building is still under construction and we don't have real occupancy yet, we're making an impact. People say we're coming in with a, a larger scope of assistance addressing basic human needs than uh, has been done before in that location. That's what we're told. Uh, we are doing um, outreach events, for instance, Tuesday and Thursday of this week, where we are serving 120 to 150 people uh, each time um, who stand in line in an hour for an hour outside our door, uh, sometimes an hour and a half waiting their turn uh, to get a week's supply of food and other essentials. I wanna talk about who we serve. We serve people who are in homelessness uh, that is like real homeless circumstances and the at-risk homeless. Anyone who has read the book Evicted knows that people in poverty are in and out of homelessness. I've witnessed this for 28 years that of people at risk 
of homelessness are often Milwaukee's very poor. And so we serve that blurry, we do not have them in two categories. We do not have the people we serve in, a, in one category of homeless and the other category of poverty because in Milwaukee, it's one big blurry population. And the people in that neighborhood where we are located, so many of them are what we call doubled up homeless. They have a roof over their head, but they're crowded into a, a place where uh, there's just so many people that the, the living conditions are very challenging. Milwaukee has for its homeless population, um, mainly African-American people, that is a reflection of Milwaukee's unresolved black-white issues. If you go to Seattle, the population is primarily Caucasian. East Coast urban areas, the population is primarily Caucasian nationally. That's uh, the population considered homeless is over 50%. But in Milwaukee, for instance, at repairs of the breach I served, 95% homeless people were African-American. And in the 53206 zip code where we are now at 24th place and center, it is 97% uh, hyper-segregated African-American. And this is the result of hyper-segregation as you would understand. And we have a concentration of people all crowded together with nearly uh, no access to uh, resources. It is considered a food desert. The people we serve are food scarce. They are undernourished. Plus they have the added uh, negative of the extremely high lead content in that neighborhood. And so when we came in and were able by um, miracle to purchase the building that we own debt-free now, this amazing facility, we recognize this is truly a food desert. And so our emphasis going forward is to do a lot with food production, but engaging the people we serve in the production of food and eventually becoming in that dimension, an employment hub. That's already happening. Uh, we invite you to study that in the PowerPoint we have a vision for each floor of our amazing facility that will have it become a major health center in this whole city, but also um, especially in that neighborhood. It is all about the vision though, the, the building, the amazing building that people are very excited about is just the greatest package for this incredibly unique vision that we have that really is relevant to what you have brought me in here to speak about because we have a model that is based on mutual transformation. It's a solidarity community. We are a solidarity community. That means that we, uh, for instance, the team doing frontline delivery right now during the pandemic for the 120 to 150 people that come to our, our outreach events every week that frontline team of volunteers is half suburban and half neighborhood. These uh, 20 volunteers represent our model, which is that the service delivery is done by a core community of blended, united people of privilege and people who are underprivileged. And the underprivileged people in this core community leadership team are people who have had the same experience as our guests. They have been homeless. They are formerly homeless people. And we are able to create a unity in that core community that has in itself an impact with the, a core value of what is named Ubuntu. It's a, it's a concept that um, Bishop Desmond Tutu introduced to the world from South Africa. Ubuntu is a concept that is about, I can't be who I am unless you can be who you are. It's that recognition of our connectedness that the world is aching for, especially at this time when there is so much 
happening that causes despair and has people in such gloom and doom. This concept of Ubuntu represents the new heart that we need uh, to navigate into the future. And our vision, we have a grip on that. Something very amazing is happening at 24th and Center. Good news is happening at 24th and Center. We are seeing people with hope. We're seeing people that looked so undernourished a couple of years ago after coming to our outreach, getting a week's supply of food over and over again. We're seeing them looking healthier. We're seeing them happy about our building. This whole neighborhood did not have bicycles until we came in. And we have people from uh, Dousman providing about 50 to 60 bicycles and tricycles every six weeks. And we've been giving them out. Now, everywhere you look in that neighborhood, there's bicycles and tricycles. But it's more than that. It's about this vision that has people realize they have a family, they have a community, you know, and we are nonpartisan. Compassion, last time I checked, <laughs> last time I checked, compassion was nonpartisan. Our community that we are building by week after week as we keep adding new community partners and as more and more people receive hope and help from us uh, growing every week, uh, we, we have then a, a sense that there is a togetherness between the privileged and the underprivileged, very unusual. We are a nonpartisan, transformational, interfaith, solidarity, community, and we are a model of what Milwaukee needs in all the division and all the segregation and all the, the um, barriers to unity that, the, that Milwaukee has, we have a model that we are showing Milwaukee as to what can be done. We can put people together from different walks of life and not have it be about one group is better than another group. So the one group is coming in to fix the other group. That's not what we're about. We are about this amazing vision that we have mutual transformation. The suburban people who are more privileged are being transformed in the process of being part of this unity, just as the people from the central city who have a low income uh, and underprivileged and very um, tragic backgrounds, some of them are being transformed by being, being part of the the unity and community that we're part of. So we we are in a neighborhood where the, there is such need. We have this huge building that we're developing and, and everyone says, that's an awful big building, but it's just perfect for the need for us to match the programming with the need. And every week and every month we're adding to the, the, the vision and the, the planning that we have is advancing. Today, we had the delivery, a very exciting, of the prototype of our future full-grown aquaponic system that MSOE students have designed. Today, the miniature of that, that MSOE students built was delivered to our building and we'll be showing that to people. We want more people to be involved. We've given out 5,000 face masks since the through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. Uh, this weekend, we're giving toys and gifts to over 800 teens and, and children who usually are not even accustomed to receiving gifts at Christmas time. We are blessed to have a, a vast uh, and growing network of faith communities of all kinds, including Buddhists, Muslims, and Jewish people. The whole bouquet are part of what we're doing. We, we are only five years old. We don't have occupancy yet, but if you study our PowerPoint, you know that the dreams, the big dreams that we are dreaming are becoming reality there are going to very much 
make a difference in the safety net of Milwaukee and in that 53206 zip code. So I invite you to study our, our website, uh, consider becoming involved, uh, just as the Whitefish Bay United Methodist Congregation has been doing, and um, be aware, um, be aware that something really great and exciting and new is happening in the 53206 zip code. Thank you, McCann and Brown. That's amazing. And thank you for offering that vision of, of hope and unity. I think it's so easy to um, dwell on the deficits and the negativity and you've really highlighted um, for us some of the transformational aspects for everybody involved in your work. So thank you for sharing that with us tonight and thank you for everything you do. Um, again, we'll be sharing contact information for all of these groups towards the end of all the presentations. Um, and we have also shared an article about McCann and Brown's um, sanctuary on our Facebook page. Um, we've shared information on almost all of the organizations that are here tonight. So if you wanna do some further reading, um, our Bay Bridge, Wisconsin Facebook page is another resource in addition to, of course, the websites and social media of all the groups that are presenting tonight. Um, thank you, McCann and Brown. And now we will be moving to um, a collective of individuals who will be presenting um, in tandem. And um, Camille Mays of the Peace Garden Project is here. Camille um, has started gardening projects in response to uh, gun violence. Uh, Camille, if you'd like to unmute yourself and um, put on your audio, we would love to ha have you um, kick off this uh, collective series. Welcome, Camille. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Camille Mays, and I shared the link in the chat. Um, I really, really ask and encourage you guys to look at the story and to um, just take a look at my journey. But um, part of the collective, oh no, okay, I'll share it again. Um, but just to give you um, a brief overview of who I am and who the other members are and how we came together. Uh, my name is Camille again, and I've met Sister McCannon Brown, um, Jakari is one of my partners. I've had the pleasure of meeting Fatima uh, from Five Points and um, going to the beautiful gallery. Um, I do a lot of community work. I don't even know how to encompass everything that I do. Um, I'm out doing community projects with UWM students. We transform vacant spaces. We do community gardens. I work with families of homicides and accidents um, in their healing journey. And um, I'll start there with our collective. Um, I've been doing peace gardens with families of homicide for five years. And I started off as a one band grassroots person and um, my fiance joined me. So now we're two uh, man, woman band. And we work with communities. Um, community groups, community members, families who want to replace the memorials that we see throughout the city. And what I do is I offer perennials for free and me and the community and the family members, uh, we plant flowers as a reminder of planting peace and love instead of death and, you know, the city looking like a cemetery. Um, I'm an avid a supporter of people against gun violence, promoting peace in the city. I've worked with the Office of Violence Prevention. Um, I'm on the board for Crime Stoppers, which is the anonymous tip line that was brought to Milwaukee. I work with block groups. I mean, I pretty much do it all. Just as a person in the community, um, deemed an organizer, but um, I'm not with the organization and I just do what I can do out there in the community. I don't even you know, um, have a big title or anything. And so, um, unfortunately, a year ago in November, um, November 10th, my son Darnell was murdered. 
Um, he was a victim of gun violence. And so this last year has been very, very hard for me. And I got slapped in the face with reality of the work that I do and being on the other side of that. And so it helped me understand that even though I had good intentions and a lot of the people that I work with had good intentions, it was ways that we could do it better and fill some of the gaps that we just really didn't even know about. And so um, this year, I had the pleasure of meeting Erica uh, from Health Connections, and we met during COVID, at the beginning of COVID, and I admired Erica, and I thought she was super dope because she was this Black woman in Milwaukee with a clinic. Um, a medical clinic and she was offering uh, COVID PPE and and trying to get COVID tested in the neighborhood when it was really really hard for people to even get regular tests and I thought that was like really really um, nice I thought you know with our community having the health disparities I was just really happy that somebody was out there fighting to get tested to black and brown people um, who might not have regular doctors and might not have access to these things. Um, and through God's grace and organic meetings and just people scrambling at the beginning of COVID, you know, they start really listening and supporting the people on the ground like us who were really out there with the people who really had a lot of the answers. And it just really helped us out with getting the support finally, you know, that we really deserve, like, Sister McCannon Brown and Jakari and you know we're out here effortlessly and, and countless days and nights and we're there without pay because of the passion in our hearts and we've just been really doing the work and part of my healing journey is continuing to help others and I've been really focused on mindfulness for myself and healing tools and coping tools to deal with the grief on top of that, people are going through COVID and COVID death. And so um, they're really having a hard time having access to those things, um, access to fitness, access to health and resources and basic needs. So that's where our collective comes in. Uh, Shaheen is, um, she's working at the Mulu Center and she's out there working with the immigrants and She's working with a lot of people who don't have access to things that they need. And so um, she's providing a lot of these things now through the collective coat drives, flu shots, COVID testing, you know, PPE. She can be a community hub. She's been helping the senior citizen center near the Maru Center with resources as well. Ambrose is fitness. He helps with how we think and our way of thinking and breathing exercises. And he's getting people fit. And in this world of COVID, people who don't have access to the gym, don't have money for the gym, for sure, or yoga or a lot of these things. So he's providing kits as well as myself so that we're not just telling people what they can do, but actually providing tools for them to do it. And Erica... She has all of the health connections, all of the, the fears and the things that people need to know what to do. She's our medical expert. She has all of the resources to therapy, to testing, to resources in regards to needs that people may have um, with lack of access to medical care in the community. And she's able to guide them on, you know, health plans and um, she helps with drug treatment. She helps with providing information um, for a lot of these different things that we don't have access and connections to and really helping connect the dots to the black and brown community. And she just won a local award. And she's also working with the neighboring community of the North Shore neighborhood and the health department as well as the Milwaukee Health Department with COVID and she just recently got a tent approved for um, testing throughout the winter. And me and my fiance are doing a series of events and giveaways. And we were really thinking about the families of homicide and COVID and 
we will be distributing healing kits to those families. Um, and those kids, uh, we have things like singing bowls, yoga mats, um, self-care journals, and things, um, gift cards so that they can get um, a pocket therapy or self-care um, things for themselves. Um, because it's a hard time right now during the holiday season. People just don't have money to do things and they just don't have access to these things. And so um, we wanna be able to provide that. We're gonna be doing an art session. We're gonna be doing some other events. We have given away kits to community organizers because who heals the healers is something that's been coming up a lot in the work and so I wanted to provide that for them even myself being a healer because I know we often get overlooked and so um, I just think it's really dope that we all got together and we teamed up and we are open uh, for support donations partners who are interested in providing resources to the community for health and wellness mindfulness um, nutrition you know, anything that meets wellness. And we really want to change the mindset of saying mental illness to mental wellness. So um, we want to really focus in on that and get rid of the stigmas attached to depression and anxiety because I personally think everybody could use therapy or life coach. So, you know, and right now I say we're all nuts because we have cabin fever and we're all a little bit nervous. And so um, we just wanted to provide some ease during these times and provide access to things people wouldn't normally be able to afford. And so, um, yeah. Thank you, um, Camille Mays, that's amazing. And you, before the um, Zoom started tonight when we were on early, you mentioned a little bit about the therapeutic value of the plants that are so lovely framing your your picture there tonight so um thank you for sharing that and i'm so sorry for your loss and um thank you for all you do for our community and um we really appreciate you being here tonight as well um thank you. i'm not sure that ambrose um is on the call um but i would like to mention that i some of us um, know him as well from, he has offered classes at the Whitefish Bay Rec Department. Um, so it is someone we are, we are familiar with. So it's nice to cross paths again. Um, and I think Erica did join us. So Erica, if you wanted to um, kind of uh, take us into the home stretch here for, and share with us a few minutes um, of what you do if you'd like to unmute and show your video, Erica, that would be great. And then we'll have hopefully time to answer. I've seen a lot of activity in the chat, a lot of questions coming in. Um, we'll get to as many as we can after um, Erica Sinclair says a few words. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much. Um, Camille, that was perfect. I'm, I was glad you went into all the details you did about the collective. So, um, so you all know how we, we came to be as a group. Um, yes, Health Connections Inc. I've been um, my um, have a medical clinic here in um, Glendale for five years now. Uh, we're right on Port Washington Road, one block south of Hampton, um, and we do primary care and um, HIV, um, Hep C, um, transgender health, uh, and uh, we just added um, a psychiatric nurse practitioner. So we're doing um, behavioral health as well. Um, so uh, one of our missions is to really be um, in the space to provide care for vulnerable populations, uh, people that don't normally have access to health care um, or they have access and it's really hard for them to get through it um, for, for various reasons. Um, most of our trans patients have really, really hard times going through traditional forms of, of health care. And this is me having worked at Aurora for five years as senior management, so I know how that system works. Um, I have a background in, in international public health. So I've set up HIV clinics and such in other countries. I work in infectious disease. I used to work at Centers for Disease Control. Um, and I work for the city of Milwaukee Health Department. And now I'm on their board of health. So it's like a whole um, full circle moment there. Um, so I know how these systems work. Um, and my passion is around how to um, fix them 
but also work within them and help people um, navigate through them. And so I, I wear different hats as a provider of sorts, um, a connector for sure, and an advocate always. So I really work in that space. And whenever I'm speaking to someone, I literally think on all levels simultaneously <laughs> because I'm trying to like, what's the issue that we can get fixed right now? What, what needs to happen next to fix this in the future for other people? And then where's the disconnect here that the provider may have that they may not even realize that they're like instituting. So I have, I, I kind of am one of my managers at Aurora. It was, he, he was my favorite manager. He said, I, 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 I manage up well. Um, cause I would, would speak to him in ways that, um, he allowed me to, and he was, it was always respectful. I'm always respectful. Um, but I'm also going to say what needs to be said in order to make it better for everybody. So, um, so being a straight shooter, um, as Missy would know, <laughs> who's on this call, um, is, um, who I am. It's just my, it's in my DNA. Community is in my DNA. So to Camille's point, uh, when COVID came, we had to uh, pivot as well. So we're doing virtual um, healthcare and we, um, and we do in, in person for our labs and things like that. Um, but only like once a week by appointment, things like, but we COVID testing, that was a highlight for me for health equity, um, to be able to get people to get tested that need to get tested. So we started doing community events. We started creating community events. We started testing at food pantries. Um, if there was a food giveaway, we would show up. Like we literally, my crew and I would get in the car with our materials and show up. And we would ask people, when's the last time you got tested? And we would, we would myth bust all day, like all day. And, that, and we still do that. Um, and at one point we got a connection with North Shore Health Department and we were able to um, get, do, in fact, we're celebrating our partnership tomorrow. So if anybody wants to come by and see the tent and then be a part of it, um, come through. We have like, we have a hundred prizes or, or gifts to give away. So please do come through. <laughs> I don't want to take those home. Um, it's 4425 North Port Washington Road is where we're located. And it's a drive through tent. Come through, get tested. Even if you don't get tested, we'll still give you the gifts because we got to give you these gifts. Um, and we're saying appreciation for it. Um, setting up the tent, it's a drive through. And the partnership that we have are from community resource navigators from um, the Employee Milwaukee program. And they were employed to do COVID relief and they're actually got trained to do testing. So it's a skill set now for them. So we're trying to raise money um, as, far, as far as our clinic is concerned to help fill the gap that th their program ends on um, the end of, of this month, so a couple of weeks. And we are raising money to see how far we can let them keep them on board with us. So we're advocating at different levels for major funding, but any funding that anyone gives towards this allows these people, and these are people who lost their jobs because of COVID. And now they're in the community serving people, you know, doing COVID testing. Um, and even though um, there's reports saying that COVID is like winding down um, and vaccine is coming and all this, I just implore people to, we still have to stay the course. We still have to, everybody's not going to get that vaccine until the end of the year um, by the time it's full coverage and enough coverage for us to really come back out, if you will. Um, so we still got to do the thing. So wow. Testing and stuff, public testing is going to be winding down. I'm trying to position health connections to still be in the um, in that particular space um, at a county level, um, so that we can still fill those gaps because that's where we are at the end of the day, our gap fillers. So whatever we can do to fill those gaps of, we go to people's homes and do testing. We test a hundred year old, a hundred four year old, both of them are positive because their their personal caregivers were positive. Um, but we're we're, ta we're talking to them, we're helping with their anxiety around testing. Um, we're helping people that are traveling. We got college kids coming home. Like different situations are happening. We tested a one-year-old that was positive. Mom is scared. How do we counsel them through that? There are not a lot of people that they can, their own providers are not even testing them. So they can't, they don't really have a lot of resources. So we, we again, just stand in the gap, fill the gap, and we definitely make sure we refer people to where they need to land, but we just stand in the gap in the meantime. So whatever we can do um, for any of you. Our number is easy. It's 414-999-1099. Give us a call. We're willing to come and set up um, testing in any location, um, do house calls, and then you can also visit us at the team. Erica Sinclair, thank you so much for your myth busting, among other things. It sounds like you offer amazing responsive healthcare services that accommodate so many different needs and congratulations on your recent award again. So thank you for what you do in our community and thank you for being here tonight and telling us more about it.
Um, we're coming very much to the end. We've run over two minutes, I think, but there was so much goodness here tonight that needed to be recognized and acknowledged. So thank you to everyone who has been here tonight, the presenters, um, attendees. Our final slide here has contact information. Um, we're going to be dropping the links into the chat as well for you to get in touch with each of these organizations and I encourage everyone to just spend um, five minutes tonight or sometime this week looking up these amazing um, community people that provide so much and make Milwaukee a, a wonderful place. Um, so much passion here, so much positive energy and really um, just wonderful to hear all these stories. So. Thank you for everyone being here tonight. Um, if people want to stay on for a few minutes, we can maybe uh, get to a few of the questions. We understand too, if you need to leave, um, but we'll keep the Zoom open for a few more minutes if people want to carry on the conversation because there's just so much positivity here. So thank you everyone. I do. Um... I do have a couple questions that showed up in the chat, if you wouldn't mind uh, highlighting. There are so many great comments and links that it might be kind of hard for uh, some of our, our speakers to maybe sort through them. Um, Jakari, is Jakari still on? Yes, I see. Uh, one of the questions was, where do you get your shoe donations from? And also, uh, what exactly do you need for the summer program? Is it just funding or do you also need volunteers? Yes, yeah, so majority of my shoes come from uh, community members. I have uh, one of my friends, his name is Jordan Poole. He plays for the Golden State Warriors. Um, so I have donations that come from that lane. I graduated from UWM with my bachelor's and my master's. So I, they still collect shoes and help me in different mm -hmm. ways. Um, so I kind of get them from all over. I'm also a big sneakerhead. So I'm a part of a lot of sneaker communities where sneakerheads donate also. And for the summer camp, uh, we're definitely going to need like speakers, people that have statue that want to come in and talk with the kids because we think that's amazing for them to meet people um, who don't mind spending time with them and who can actually invest in them. And besides that, uh, and funding is another huge thing just to make sure we can do this properly and safely. Um, I did a summer camp this past summer. I had to shorten it down. So I only had like 15 kids in my vicinity, but it was okay because COVID was kind of higher at the time and everybody had to wear masks and things. This year with the vaccine being now, we hoping that we can kind of get back to normal, but also putting the kids in a great space. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, nope. Very resourceful. And I love that. Thank you for making a direct request for uh, speakers. So please reach out to Jakari and uh, let them know if you can help that way. Um, and I think the PayPal information was also um, in, the, in the links. You thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. All right, the next question um, was from uh, Melissa Oogland. And I wasn't sure if you meant it for everyone. Um, or uh, a specific speaker, but how are you seeing families' needs change in the time of COVID? Is any of our speakers, or Missy, were you directing that at a particular person? No, just anybody. Thanks, Carrie. Mm -hmm. Anyone what want to? I'm seeing, um, just picture this. So, like, picture everybody who was doing okay like maybe a group of well-off people are now middle class. The middle class people who were barely making it are now poor. And then the people who were already poor are scraping, scraping for scrap, scraping to stay in their houses. And then um, landlords is offering a unique situation for me to look at with like landlords, um, and tenants. Tenants don't have money because they're losing jobs. Landlords don't have money to keep up the stuff because they're losing jobs. So it's a real unique circumstance of desperation for a lot of people. And I've seen a lot of people become resilient with um, a lot of businesses are popping up in this time of COVID, side hustles, um, 
a lot of people are finding a lot of creative ways to make money in this time of COVID. A lot of people who had a lot of hidden skills that they just went dormant on are really exploring options um, that way. And I've been just seeing like people really, really in a, a stressful mode, people who are already down. It's just like the food pantries, they're there, but they're running out of food. You know, um, a lot of the resources are burnt up. So a lot of the people on the ground, um, like Jakari said, and I'm an avid supporter of people on the ground as a grassroots organizer in small organizations. They have the passion, but not the funding. So donate to whoever you know who's out there organizing um, because they need it every step of the way. Um, a lot mm -hmm. of these people um, need administrative support. If anybody wants to volunteer and offer some of them people help with paperwork, uh, writing up small grants, um, supporting them in partnerships on things you want to get involved with, um, anything like that, you know, is very useful to help the people on the ground get more resources. They know a lot of the ways. They know a lot of the way, you know, what's needed. If people would just support some of those people a little more and, um, you know, whoever has any wellness, um, tips, education, tools, breathing, anything to help people with getting through these times. People are stressed out. People are grieving. People are worried about insurances, worried about their health. You know, if anybody knows things like that, you know, just pass it on, please. Yeah. And I'll second what Camille says. I know for me, uh, a lot of my students, what this change I'm noticing is a lot of my students that are online now, they're putting school second and they're putting work first. So a lot of my students are picking up jobs and they like, Mr. Carr, you don't understand, you know, I have to, I got to help my mom. I have to help my dad. Like, I, I like school, but right now we struggling. And so like now you got the kids who really should be getting their education working and so, you know, that's going to lead to them continuing to work. Education will be a second thing. Uh, and then they're not going to want to go to college or anything like that. The parents, as much as they would love for their kids to be in school, they need the help. Uh, so it's just everything is kind of screwed up right now. And uh, with us being grassroots, we're just trying to figure out ways to help. So I know a lot of my parents who usually have funds for themselves, they needed food because of COVID. And they weren't personally comfortable with going to uh, to get food from pantries and things. So, you know, when I was receiving grants, I was writing the grant, uh, the organization that was giving the grant, asking like, hey, can I do some food giveaways? Because there's people in need. I can buy supplies and things like that. But more than programming, they need food. Um, so I, I'm definitely with Camille. Um, a lot of support needed as far as like financially, but then also just having someone to to contact and someone that can have resources. Yep, and I would say is, we do a lot of behavioral health um, work because of of the um, of COVID. Um, even with our staff, our staff come from the community, so you know it's hard for them to work and also have this distraction of I'm about to lose my housing. I'm about to, you know, my kid is at home by themselves and they're 10, three and four, you know, like this is real for them. So while they're trying to work and try to earn this money, they're, they have these other worries at home, which, you know, I pick up on and I have conversation with them. And so it's hard to take the um, services that you're offering other people. You know what I'm saying? Like that's, that's hard to do. Um, but we figure out a way to do it with compassion and, and, you know, to the side and we send resources to them. And whenever I can, I figure out a way to slip them an envelope. It's like my grandmother would say. <laughs> slip them an envelope with somebody. And honestly, going through our, our tent, because our testing is free right now because the state is, is, um, is taking care of it. Um, we have, they have, people have actually, without, without any um, solicitation, they've given them $50, you know, $40. Like they've given them money. And when I say that we've used that money to help them get food for people that on our team that work for us that otherwise wouldn't eat. Um, you know, I feed them as much as I can. Anybody that knows me, I'm, I try to feed people. <laughs> That's what I do. Um, I come from a family of cooks, so we feed people. Um, but 
when we can't and they just need that, having that plate of food to take home is huge. And these are my workers. So beyond that, when we go in the community, it's just as, it's just as hard, but they are so grateful that they can still help people while they're yet also getting them their, their own help. So it's huge, but it's a, it's a crazy dynamic to be in, that's for sure. I'd like to respond here. And that yes. is uh, where we are located. Uh, it was already the most extreme food desert in Wisconsin. So food was already scarce and the people there the many who live there in poverty and do not have cars, they were already food scarce. There's no supermarkets, there's no 7-Eleven type fast, or there's no 7-Eleven type quick stop stores. There's only two fast food places. All there are are these neighborhood stores that are mom and pop, they're called mom and pop stores that are houses that have been converted into privately owned stores where the prices are triple. The can of tuna is two and a half dollars. The um, bag of sugar is four dollars. So if you don't have a car or don't know anyone with a car and you live in this poverty and scarcity, it, it has been very, you just don't have access to uh, very much nutritious food. Uh, so when we started doing the outreach there, we were serving 30 to 50 uh, people in line, uh, some of them representing households of six to 10 people and we would start giving food and essentials. But since the pandemic, as I said, our numbers are 120 to 150 people each time. And what we, what we have see, a lot of times you see the food giveaways as drive, drive ups, curbside, drive throughs. But our people, the people we serve who are the neediest in Wisconsin come with, with children's wagons, they come with strollers to put that bag of food in. They come with walkers to put that food on their transportation and uh, a freezer chest on wheels, a suitcase on wheels. This is the transportation our people come with and they are so appreciative. If people watching want to look uh, at our urgent appeal list for food in order to keep up the momentum that we have in providing a week's supply of food to the people we serve. That's on Facebook. You'll find several posts on Facebook with that. And other urgent appeals are on our, on our website. We just um, are so, I'm, I'm just so aware that there is social conscience uh, in the viewing and listening here of people wondering, what can we do? You know, that is a rare and precious flower and we are, we're all um, grateful. I'm sure the other presenters are grateful for this opportunity to speak to a listening of that nature. Thank you. And I was gonna say that, you know, it takes innovative programming and thinking outside of the box to alleviate a lot of these disparities that we're seeing in grassroots work. And, you know, it's not easy. You have to look at the history of why things are the way that they are and address that before, you know, you can't put a Band-Aid on a gushing artery. So mm -hmm. I really appreciate the work that you're doing and the work that everyone's doing because it really truly takes a village to deal with a lot of these very complex issues that are complex, but not so complex at the same time. We make it more complex than it has to be. And so I'm really grateful for everyone here. And, um, you know, I hope that we can continue to support each other and continue dialogue with each other. That's so important because you can have a million resources, but if it's not directed or focused in the right way, you don't alleviate the problem. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. We're, we're going to let you go, but this has been an amazing evening. And I feel like instead of ending this, this is really the beginning of new relationships and new partnerships and new ways to cooperate. So again, um, let's all let's all look at these organizations again, um, do our own research and keep talking because um, working together is the way that um, is going to be the way forward for all of us. So thank you for everyone's good work. Thank you for being here tonight and have a great rest of the evening. Hope to see you all again soon. Thank you. Have, have a good night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Be well.
Thank you, panelists. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Be well. Thank you. Be well and be safe. Thank you. you. Thanks, Kai. Thanks, Jakari. Yeah. Thank Thanks, you. Erica. Thank you so much. Erica, Erica, I don't think you um, do you have donation information, Erica? I do. I, was, I have one for the collective and I have one for uh, for me. So I'm sending one for the collective now. And we got we got Jakari's, right? I, g I gave a PayPal, but the pa the pa so my Jakari kicks for kids on my Facebook. The way we had it on the uh, on the uh, PowerPoint, it's not spelled the same way. It's spelled Jakari kicks for kids, like spelled out Jakari kicks F O R I D S, and so they could just use my Gmail Jakari kicks for kids at gmail .com. Can you put that in the chat? Um, yes, ma'am. I did. Yeah, it's in there. We got uh, it. All right. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you guys. Yep. Thank, you, Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks for being here. And I appreciate you a million plus more. All right, we need to talk then. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Bye bye. Awesome. I don't know who Sam is here. I think that's Mr. Sims. Oh, that's right. No, oh, yeah. it's not. Or no. Rachel or oh, Mr. Sims. No. Hello. I think so is that is that Mr. Sims? Looks like it would be. I think that's Mr. Sims. Yes. Ah, I was right. <laughs> Hello. Were were you on all? Were you on the whole time? Did we miss you? Um, yes, I was listening, but I I wanted to not interfere because right now I'm I'm uh, to be honest with you. I'm in quarantine, so I'm oh. trying to save my energy and. Uh, I just wanted to add to the group. Uh, thank you uh, for sharing this with us and doing through this. And uh, to get back to some of the things that we're doing here in Five Points, which is very, very phenomenal. And then being able to work with the group, especially Bay Ridges, we did some tremendous things together. Uh, I just want to also mention that not only are we showed a lot and all that, what we were trying to do there. But we also have worked with the uh, Green Bay Park that we're going to, it's going to be redone. And uh, we was instrumental in laying out a format on what we wanted there and how we want it to be shaped up. But the other thing that I would love to uh, and part with you now, if I'm stuttering, I may not talk too long, but <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> I'm trying to fight this off so I can be able to do this. But uh, our projects that we have done and, and worked on through mental health, through the COVID package giveaway, and all our things that we've done and, and working with. Um, uh, Bay Bridges has been a has been very instrumental and very enlightening, and we're also working with the in our infrastructure. So we are trying to make life for our seniors the best we can, and uh, it has been a struggle. Uh, we have done you know, food pantry, we did food runs. And uh, so I think this is maybe why I, why I became quarantined now a little bit because uh, getting these things out to the people who need them. And uh, similar, I know everyone has a project and an idea and the only way to get them to fruitation that we all want is that we should continue to work together, that we continue to uh, be cognizant of others and their health. And uh, if you can uh, also go to our 
Facebook page, you can see some of the things that we have accomplished and we, what we are trying to accomplish. And uh, gentrification has been one of the most uh, discussed subjects within uh, Five Points. So we're asking that you would think of us, think of how we're in this together. And that that's, at this point in time, uh, that we can do these things and work together on them as far as getting those uh, COVID and other package things deal that we need to take care of. So I will ask all of you to bear with me and hopefully taking all these pills that I'm taking right now to stay safe. So you guys stay safe with this. And uh, always good to see you. And it's always good to have everyone working for a common goal. Thank you. Oh, that's Thank awesome. You. Sam, if you need anything, make sure you let us know. Yeah, take care of yourself. Yes. Let me know. I mean, yeah. Uh, you, have to, you have to you have to you have to take care of yourself before you can take care of others especially at, at this moment in time it's super important all right thank you very much yeah. and uh good to see all of you there good to see and, you yeah. and so you guys have a good evening all right thank you, take you. Care. be well yeah. all right and i guess i'll go take a pill <laughs> <In rest. laughs> okay then all good right. night. Good, good night. night. Good night. Kathy, did you, there were a couple other things that came up in the chat, I think, before you, or after you captured it. The uh, health, con health connections information and then Jakari. I just want to make sure you got it. Yeah, saved. I okay. saved it. Okay, cool. It's, I don't know if you guys know, but the three dots on there, you can save the whole chat. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. What is that the file? There's I saw a file icon on there. Um, it's the three dots. If you go click on the three dots oh. and then you can see save chat. And then where does that go? Where does it save <laughs> to? That's gonna be my question. It goes into your finder. Um, let's see, it is downloads in, or oh show in folder. Yeah, I believe it shows up in like the iCloud. Oh, oh, there's this is, well, there's a Zoom. Some, yeah, sometimes oh, a yeah, new screen Zoom. will come up after your Zoom call. There should be like a, a box that comes up and it shows that it's got a folder in it. Yeah, I've got it all here. Okay. okay. I've got it opened and. Um, so. Do we want to just take two seconds? Oh, wait, that's not it. Hold on. Oh, yeah, you want to make sure it's not garbledy gook. Right, that was from a meeting earlier today that I saved. Let me see. I have one. I have it. You have it? Yeah. So I could definitely okay. send. Yeah, I could definitely send it. You have the whole thing? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, but we, I just wanted to make sure we 